This is the second of our old school projects. It's a staghorn hinge and we made this from inch and a quarter by 316 flat stock. Gives us an excellent opportunity to practice our splitting and for rolling the barrel of the hinge. To complete the project you're going to need a hot cut chisel, a 3 8 round drift pin, a bit of scrap plate for cutting on, a 3 quarter inch half round bottom swage and if you have it a larger bottom swage or a dish in your um, swage block to accommodate dishing the, the material for the hinge prior to rolling the hinge. Here's my taper, it's about uh, 5 inches long or so, you can see it starts about here, about 5 inches long, fairly straight, and I've left myself about 3 eighths of an inch on the end. That's important for me, uh, one is I can sweeten that a little later, by leaving it thick I've got somewhere I can park the chisel and have a look and see what I'm doing. And don't forget you're going to lose some of this material to the um, chamfer of the chisel as you cut. When I look at my slitting chisel, I'm looking for something that has got a crown surface to the end. And typically for me, I like about a sixteenth rise as compared to the corner. When I look at a normal chisel, that corner, that edge of the chamfer, has been ground away on my hot cut chisel. Uh, I consider that to be friction, and I don't want it there. So I just have a nice smooth curve. And you'll notice I've also got a cutting edge on one side of my chisel. One side is round, one side is cutting edge and this is a sort of sight that I can look down to make sure I'm going the right direction. This should be in line with my edge and my edge has got a slight flat on it. Let's call that a 64th, a 32nd maybe. Now, I don't take it to a sharp edge. I don't care for the sharp edge. I like a slight flat and for me that just breaks apart the, uh, the cut at the last little bit so I'm not uh, having to cut all the way through. It leaves me with a little rag but I'm okay with that. As I go to curve the horns, what I'm going to do is the material that's furthest away from my hammer, I'm going to knock it down, turn the bar over, furthest away, knock it down, and then that puts the bit near me in a forgeable plank. The horns of a stag are proud of the head. The head's going to be here, or the face is going to be here. So I don't want to over curve these and make them like a water buffalo. I want to keep them proud uh, above the head. I can always come back later and sweeten them if I need to. So once I've established the opening split, and that's about equal, I'm now going to work on these individually. I'm going to judge the, the horns to see if they've been opened equally by holding them along the offside edge of the anvil and this perpendicular to the face, and that's within parameters for me. These are the stack horns. Uh, split and bent and you can see on this side this is as forged this is still a little thick at the end here and I've not done anything to improve this sectional size. On this side I've peened out this side here and this side here and I've drawn that over the back a little bit and I've sweetened up that little end and I'm hoping to get a little more mass here. I'm going to come in with my chisel and cut these and then open up a little horn so I need a little bit of uh, material there, otherwise it's going to look too thin, too weedy. This is a better look at that ridge and you can see it comes from this inside edge to that inside edge over there and you should see a sharp shadow line and I'm trying to suggest another set of horns. I'm going to cut for my two horns 
a little later and I'm also going to sweeten up that end but I'm going to do that after I've made the face and rolled the eye of the hinge because uh, I don't want to lose the horns in the fire as I'm working this. To pull the material out to make the face I'm going to work from the back of the, the bar and I'm going to use my rounding hammer to basically create two divots. I'm going to try and leave that spine as it's a, a structural component of the hinge. We're going to be putting some um, screw holes in here and here's our barrel and I need something running through the middle that's going to carry that weight. Depending on your forge you may not have room to get the horns in and heat this up. You may have to come and sever this from the bar and so you can hold this with a pair of tongs and work on this end. And again another reason why we didn't cut those horns so you can get your tongs in there and still be able to work this end. I have four of these heads to make, two pair of hinges. So I've cut my first one off at four and a half inches. I don't know if that's correct yet. I know I need material for the head, I know I need a little gap, and then I need material for the barrel. And I'm going to keep a record of any excess I trim off, and then for the following heads I can just make my measurement accordingly and make my cut in the right place. I used a rounding hammer to pull out the, the cheeks for the face, uh, using the edge of the hammer as a fuller. I could have used my cross peen, but my cross peen is just too wide to get the desired result. So I went to my second hammer, which is my Farrier's rounding hammer, and just pulled out the material, leaving that ridge in the centre for a structural component. Remount your horns to the edge of the anvil and then check to make sure that the, the head is perpendicular. Sometimes when pulling out the cheeks for the face, you can move a horn. So make sure those are correct. If not, put them back in place. There are a number of ways we could uh, arrange the hinge. I've got a three knuckle example here, a two knuckle example, and what I intend to do with this project is a two knuckle example where the hinges are just staggered. With any of the examples, the amount of clearance that you give back here will dictate how open this hinge can be. And you can see this has got no clearance and so it won't go past 180 degrees. This one is designed to fold in half. That's not going to work for my project. Mine's project's going to be a, a log bin. Uh, so I need to be able to bend this. This is the top of the hinge. This is going down the face of the log bin. And that little half inch of clearance that we've allowed ourselves allows this bottom piece to move around without impedance. For this hinge we're going to have a 3 8 of an inch eye to the barrel of the hinge and we're using 3 16 material to actually create the whole hinge. So the true diameter is going to be the thickness of the material, in this case 3 16 plus the inside diameter 3 8 which is going to give us 3 8 plus 3 sixteenths, 9 sixteenths. So 6 sixteenths plus 3 sixteenths, 9 sixteenths. Circumference for me equals pi times diameter. Circumference is 3 for me for pi. I don't uh, muck around with the small stuff too much. Times the diameter of 9 sixteenths. And that's going to give me 27 sixteenths, which I'm going to round up to 28 sixteenths because that's easily divisible and that will compensate for me being a little shy with pi. So 28 sixteenths is going to simplify to one and three quarters of an inch material. That's the length of material that we need to roll the eye. When we roll the eye, typically what I like to do is I like to sweeten this end so it tucks in nicely. If we look at it as cut from the bar, you can see that, that being 90 degrees, that gives us a little gap in here. And that doesn't give us a full bearing surface and might even that corner may even gall the, the pin or the pintle. So I'm going to sweeten up that end just a little bit. I don't want to over sweeten it because if I do that I run the risk of thinning this material and when we stack our two hinges together This is the look I want, is a nice flush surface here. If one of those has been thinned on one side and thinned on the other side, now I'm going to have a joggle in the hinge and that's not what I want. My next move is to make the barrel for the hinge. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, cut it off to the right length, sweeten the very end of it 
and then roll the barrel and we're after a one knuckle. You'll notice I've drawn this down, this is oh, uh, about an inch and I've drawn it down from the inch and a quarter that we started with. So I'm looking to draw that down and I'm probably going to start that on the bick using my rounding hammer. This is our result so far. I'm going to call the bottom of the head about there, so I've got a little elongation to the face. I'm going to leave half an inch or so of material uh, just to get me away from the head as I roll the barrel, and the rest is going to be the barrel. I know I'm going to cut off that excess material, and I'll keep a record of that. I also know I need about an inch and three quarters after I've sweetened the end. So I'm probably going to cut this, or let's say inch and five eighths or so, and just sweeten that last three eighths of an inch. As I make my chisel cut, I'm going to define the lower reaches of my face. This is on the back side, not on the front. I'm going to come down my inch and five eighths, and I'm going to cut from the back side, which is going to give me that chamfer, and that chamfer is going to get rolled onto the front side to sweeten up the, the barrel of the hinge. For all the hinges I want to sweeten the end a little bit to allow it to tuck in nicely as we roll the eye. I'm going to sweeten the last three-eighths or half an inch or so, no more than that, I'm going to see evidence of it when I, the hinge is open. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to crown it away from the roll and that's going to compensate for the deflection of the edges when I go to roll the hinge, when I feed this out. And I'm going to feed it out very slowly with the crown up as I start to roll this eye. Using a large bottom swage, and you might find this on your swage block, I've got a purpose-built bottom swage here. With the face up, I'm just going to stick the barrel of the hinge in, and with my cross peen, I'm going to try and dish this, put a crown on the bottom surface, on the back side, because the hinge is going to get rolled over onto the top side. So the crown goes towards the back side. Once I get to this stage, I might slip my drift pin in and start to roll over the drift pin. Again, I'm working here typically. If I feel I've rolled too much, I'm going to work from here and work down. And that's going to open up the hinge just a little bit. If I've rolled too much material, I'm going to start together and roll down. But typically, come up. And I'm going to focus my blows on the edges to compensate for the deflection of that outer edge as we roll the material up. My drift is actually quite long. I've got the main body of the drift and then two long tapers. A taper to the working end, a slow taper to open up the barrel if it's too tight, and a taper to the struck end to allow the struck end to clear when this is getting close to the top of the barrel. If you're having problems with the back of the hinge bending or not being straight, consider using a bottom swage. This would be 3 8 plus 3 16 plus 3 16, 3 quarter inch bottom swage. And I can now come in there and help sweeten up that material, straighten out anything I need to do. Here is our result so far. The hinge barrel is perpendicular to the, the centre line of the face. Either side of the hinge barrel is round and we didn't over curl the hinge barrel with the material. It finished roughly in line with the mark that we'd made earlier. Now that we've finished rolling the barrel of the hinge, I'm going to turn my attention to the rack and I'm going to start cutting for those individual horns. 
I have a pair of tongs that I've made specifically for this. You can see that the um, material grasps the uh, barrel of the hinge. If I were to make them again, I'd make that open jaw side just a little longer uh, to stop it from pivoting in the jaws, but these work quite well. I've sweetened up the end of the rack on the big, make that a nice sharp point, and I'm going to cut from here and try and lift two horns. When I cut, I try and get the root of the cut somewhere near the middle. If you're off to one side, it's just going to push the whole of the material out and it's not going to look right. When you go to open out these horns, make sure you place the bick well behind the horn. If you don't do that, you run the risk of putting a kink just at the base of the horn. You want a nice sweeping S-curve. Once you've finished forging the hinge, I'm going to drill or punch for the screw holes, for the mounting holes. These two are sort of cast in stone, those are going to be the eyes. These are variables, depending if you've got a seam in the woodwork. So these will move left or right to accommodate any seam. The last thing I'm going to do is run a file through the, the barrel of the hinge, just to clean that up, make sure it's free flowing, and then that is ready for sale. If you like the look of the three knuckle hinge, the way that I remove this centre section, the way I find easiest, is this is the allocation I have for the hinge. I've come back behind that, let's say the thickness of the hinge material, in this case 3 16th of an inch or so. And I've slot punched, not back, not clearing that, I've just put it in from one side. And I've slot punched narrower than the gap I think I need, because I'm going to add to that the thickness of the two hacksaw cuts. And then I'm going to roll the hinge up, once the hinge is rolled, I'm going to cut down here, remember cut outside of the, the mark that you want, and then I'm just going to use a punch and just clean that out with the punch and then file to fit. 